expected if the people elected me. So I, I had a platform of don't take contributions from employees, change the political culture from patronage and politics to about professionalism and public safety. Um, I wanted to take my name off all the vehicles. It wasn't shouldn't be a bulletin board for some politician. It should be about the Worcester County Sheriff's Office. And those are just the first things I said I'd do and then raise the hiring standards. So you either had to serve your country or you had to have a college education to get your foot in the door just because there was a dumping ground for people, you know? So when I first ran for sheriff, I was all excited to talk about those issues and the things I would do. That was, by the way, going to take me day one to do those things. But it was 50 years in the making. Right. So when I first ran for sheriff, I'd go around the community, hey, I'm running for sheriff. And I swear to God, you know what the first people say to me? We have a sheriff? <laughs> no, that's the God. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. And then I realized, oh, my God. And then I explained to them, you know, why we have one. And then say, they'd be like, why do we have a sheriff? Like, right. it why was, do we need one? We have why the, do we the need police one? department. And we have the Department of Corrections. Yeah. And it was all this stuff. And I remember thinking, how disheartening is that in a way to run for a position that the majority of people maybe didn't even know existed? Mm -hmm. And the ones that did couldn't figure out why we had What's one to begin point? with. Yeah. Exactly. So... That's why I appreciate the opportunity to come on board with it. And you'll figure out one thing. We got, you know, 30 minutes. You give me the message here. I, I can talk fast. Yeah. Okay. I'm a fast talker. So I want to get into some of the answers of what, but if, go ahead. If you yeah, want to. So, yeah. so the, uh, Jan, uh, Manny just, you just mentioned Department of Corrections, right? right? So what's the difference between a jail and a yeah. prison? Yeah. So I'll explain because the sheriff and I'll answer all this stuff. So I always, I speak to groups constantly and I always try to educate them. And I say to people, you may know more in the next minute than 95% of the population knows. And it's as simple as this. What is the difference? Why do we have a Department of Corrections and a Sheriff's Department? And the reason is this, the difference is this. Sheriff's Department take all the pretrial people. So if you're arrested in Worcester County, for example, and you come to the judge and you're pretrial and you can't make bail or you've got a crime that has no bail, you'll be held at the Worcester County House of Correction. Then if you get sentenced at some point to two and a half year felony conviction or greater, you will go to the Department of Corrections, which is a completely different state system. And if you get a lesser sentence, you can be sentenced to the House of Correction. So the jail is an awaiting ground where people are waiting trial. And the House of Corrections is for sentenced people who are serving a sentence. And if they get beyond, as I said, the two and a half years, then they will go to the State Department of Correction. So our primary job is this. And, and it is to the care, custody, and control of our inmate population. Mm. That is what we do. If you had one headlight. But it's so small representation of what the sheriff's department does. I, I'll tell you this. I am so proud to be sheriff of this county. I grew up in a three-decker here in Worcester. And, you know, I, I lived in five different states before I ended up coming back home. Mm. Um, and I lived, you know, in Boston and then Framingham. But I moved back to, to my hometown of Holden. I lived in Worcester, then moved to Holden, bought, a house, bought my grandparents' house. So I right next to my mom and dad and I was 40 years old when I first ran for office. So I was not a career politician. I didn't even want to get into it in my younger days, but I just thought, you know, at this point in life, I actually took the teacher certification exam when I was 40 years old and I was going to become a high school history teacher or I was going to get elected to public office. High school I, history teacher. Did that you hear was, that, man? That's where I was going. Yeah. So well, Believe it or not, that's what I was going to do. Really? I, was, I went to college to be a high school history Well, you're teacher. still young. You can no, still do it. I'm all set. I'm all set with the school system. No, thank you. I love what I do. Media is <laughs> great. Um, but yeah, no, I'm all set with that. Well, I'll tell it you was one a good thing. idea. I like teaching, and I, I still get to teach kids mm -hmm. through this platform. So I take a lot of the youth in the community. We bring them in here, and we teach them about media. So well, I'm Manny, still a teacher. I wanted, I, I'm glad you said that, because I would tell you precisely the same thing. You know, one of the first things we did, now we're getting a little off track, but you know, it's an important thing to talk about. Yeah. When I first got elected sheriff, I came in and as I talked about, we were reformers. Make no mistake about it. And you can have anybody on here. If they they know what we did, it was to reform a system that was broken there was and make it work. There quite a few people that were uh, legacies in the sheriff's mm -hmm. department when you came in that no longer work in corrections at all. Exactly. I mean, it was, I said it was really known to be a dumping ground for patronage. And that's mm -hmm. not what this is about. It's too important a job. I mean, we have to rehabilitate people who come into our care. You can't do it with, and I'll just be quote unquote, a bunch of hacks. You need to have professional people who are committed, who are caring or compassionate. As my pastor said at my benediction, and it hangs on my wall, may it truly be a house of correction. Mm. Yeah. You know, that's what we have worked in all my time in sheriff every day, every hire. We want this to be a house of correction because if people get out and they've turned their life around, we all win. They win. They're more productive citizens. Their families win. They're safer. The community wins. So it's hard work. Don't make light of it. It's hard work, right. but it's rewarding, but you need to be focused. But on the point about education, 
You know, man, one of the things I, I asked a lot of the inmates when I first walked around, how'd you end up incarcerated, you know? And I learned after not too long that the stories were eerily similar. And I'll tell you, I started this program to go into the schools because my thought process was, here's back to teacher. You know what? I got this unique position of being sheriff and I have the opportunity to kind of recidivism is the key to what we do. We want to break the chain of recidivism. We want to stop the family. We, well, I've got another issue. We, we've got a parenting program. We're just starting now. Spectrum News just came up and did a story on it. Mm -hmm. We want to reunite families with their kids, parents, fathers with their kids when they're incarcerated so they can learn to be, they take parenting classes. Then the reward is to be, have your contact visits with your children, you know? Yeah. But the one thing I heard, and I, I, can, I can speak quickly here, but I developed a program to go into schools. Because I thought, who better than the sheriff himself to go into the schools and talk to the young people about myths and facts about drugs? Because that's where it was at. When I got elected, the opioid crisis was out of control. I had two teenage kids. I knew what the pressures they were facing. Let's develop a program to go into schools. And it was called Face to Face. And I'll give you an example. Myth, facts. Myth, I can quit anytime I want, you know? Uh, myth, uh, Oxycontin's not a drug. It's a medicine. I mean, all these myths, you know? So I thought we could dispel those myths. So... When I talked to the inmates and they told me their life story, I figured I could talk to the kids when I go to these schools. And by the way, I put this program in front of 400,000 students, 400,000 myself, because it let me be a teacher while I was serving as sheriff. But the message was this, and I'd say towards the end of the presentation, I'd say, I could sum up the life story of almost everyone in the criminal justice system in 15 seconds. And you know, who can believe that, you know? But what I'd say was, I was in middle and high school, started getting exposed to drugs, started doing drugs and alcohol. And next thing I know, I was stealing from my family to support my, my habits. They kicked me out. I moved in with a friend. I stole from them to feed my habits. Next thing you know, I went downtown, got arrested, and ended up incarcerated. Now, that's about 11 seconds. But I asked that. At the, I talked to the inmates. We have a lot of programs up there. I get to know them. I talk to them. One group I went before, and they told them that story. And one guy raised his hand. Sheriff, you, you got that wrong. I said, oh, how's that? He goes, I stole from my grandparents. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? So my idea was bring that message to the youth. And that allowed me to bring that message of hope and redemption. Like I just prayed at the kids. I do. I say at the very end, I said, I look, I pray for you to feel life story, not to be summed up in 15 seconds. Your life stories should be about the joys that your life has had. It should be told in hours and volumes. And it means the highs in life don't come from a bottle or a needle or a pill. It comes from making your family proud, from getting a job, from serving your country, from graduating from school, you know, that kind of dignity that comes from that. So that's allowed me to be a teacher while I'm sheriff. And mm -hmm. imagine the blessing I've had to have that position like you're doing here. Yeah. Same kind of work. And how are you addressing some of the roots of those problems? Because as you know, a lot of addiction is rooted in mental illness. Absolutely. You know, and, and a lot of mental illness is rooted in things like systemic oppression. A lot of our dads, I'm I mean, not me personally, but mm -hmm. I, I grew up in Great Book Valley. Mm -hmm. So back in the 90s, a lot of the families there, uh, their fathers were not present because of either drugs or jail. And a lot of them were jailed wrongly because of things like marijuana that is now a business now. And those families were torn apart, right? So a lot of those kids grew up you know, being the man of the house now. They have mm -hmm. to go make money, maybe can't get a regular job. So now they're selling drugs. Now they're get, uh, exposed to drugs that they're now doing, getting arrested for that. And, you know, it's like a one big messy. Sure. Everything's all jumbled together. Mm -hmm. um, what are you doing for those people who, you know, they, they just they had a real tough life and, you know, PTSD. I'm, I, I will say I, I, I do. Me and a lot of people in my community don't like law enforcement. Mm -hmm. We don't get along with law enforcement. We look at law enforcement like law enforcement like the boogeyman. We stay away, even mm -hmm. if we're not doing anything sure, wrong. Of course, right? And every time we get in front of somebody, not you personally. I mean, I'm very comfortable with you, but you know, if when I get pulled over, I start. You know what I mean? I'm hyperventilating. I'm shaking. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, I did get pulled over. It wasn't in Worcester County, but I did get pulled over. And one of the reasons why I failed um, a field sobriety test when I was sober, the cop said I was shaking. Mm -hmm. That was PTSD. I'm shaking because I'm afraid of you as a cop. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So there's things like that that get us put into sp specific situations. And specifically, in my uh, experience, the black and brown communities. Mm -hmm. What are you doing for those communities to rehabilitate that? Yeah. Well, first thing I'll say, Mate, is like this job ain't easy. Yeah. These are not easy. What you just laid out there is a very, very complex problem that needs to be fixed on every level. So... I can only do what I can do. But I'll tell you what I did. I met with 11 new correctional officers today. 
you know, people are going to put it off our spot in our academy. And the first thing I tell them all, besides congratulations for getting in that door, because they didn't do it because they knew somebody. Mm. They came in because of who they are and mm. what they can offer to our department. But what I first tell them is I said, why do you want to work here? And the answer I look for, and I'll try to give it away here, but is I want to help. I want to help people. Because I tell them all, I said, I don't have a robe. You know what I mean? I'm not a judge. They've already been judged. Yeah. People come into our care, custody, and control have already been judged. Now they're in our care, custody, and control. And what our job is, is to reach those people that want to help. Now, look, you may be familiar with folks. There's a lot of people come through our facility every year. Some don't want to help themselves, man. You got to be honest. I can't help somebody if they don't want to help themselves. But what we have done is set up an institution that is based on that concept. Of do you have house- mental health? advocates oh yeah health oh yeah professionals oh yeah maybe for those who who seem like they don't want to help mm-hmm. themselves really just don't know how to help themselves yeah. and therefore they yeah. avoid it right yeah um i there's a lot of things that i don't know how to do that i mm-hmm. just avoid because i'm all, like taxes and things like that I, I'll, I'll avoid it let somebody else deal with that you know what i'm yeah. saying um so i i feel like the root of a lot of crime mm-hmm. is mental health mm-hmm. and we need to take that very seriously and you right. do have mental health Oh, yeah. Well, let me explain one thing, because you're you're spot on on that. What's up, Worcester? And welcome back to another segment of the sit down here with John Keo and my man Lou Evangelitis. Listen, thank you for being so open and passionate and letting me know all the things that you're doing in the first segment. Uh, John has some more questions, so I'm going to hand it over to you, sir. Absolutely. So take it away. So one of the programs that I've been following is um, where you've brought companies that are willing to hire inmates Mm -hmm. as they're getting out into the jail. Right. Right. that's pretty revolutionary here in Massachusetts. For many years, it was actually not allowed, right? Mm-hmm. Particularly at the state level. Uh, and so what work did you have to do to change that, right? And then attract companies to come in that are willing to work with men and women who are getting out sure. after committing, you know, a crime? Mm-hmm. Well, one benefit of being sheriff is you can kind of set the policies. You have a lot of leeway and discretion over policies. So my attitude is, Let's just see what works, you know. Let's keep our mind open to what works. And I'll say this on the ideas I've learned is that, first of all, the greatest social program in the world is a job in my book. Yeah. You know, and I'll give you an example. I've had Staying busy, right? Staying busy, yeah. priding for your family, the dignity. I, had, I remember having one. I had a program. I'd send people out, do work in the community, you know, give back. A voluntary program. Mm-hmm. I was talking to a couple of guys that were out there one day. I was visiting them and. I remember I said to him, I said, how are you doing this program? And he said to me, Sheriff, I, I can't thank you enough for letting me be in this program. I said, well, what do you mean? He's like, every morning I get up. This was a, uh, this was a, trend, a big moment for me, really, in my time as sheriff. Because these exact words were, Sheriff, thank you. Because every morning I look forward to waking up. The officer comes and gets me, brings me in the community. You know, and I feel a sense of satisfaction and dignity that the folks thank me for the work I'm doing. And you know what? He goes, I haven't felt this sense of dignity and self-worth in a long time. And when I get out, Sheriff, this is what I want to do with my life. I want to have that feeling that comes of dignity uh, and, and self-respect that comes from working every day. And I remember thinking, he thanked me for that opportunity. And I realized there's no dignity and dependency. Nobody wants that. People want dignity in working and, and providing. And what we can try to do is get people on that path. So what we've done is, I remember us talking to uh, some other sheriffs one day. We were just brainstorming. It came up with the idea of why don't we, instead of, uh, with, with the idea in mind that the greatest program is a, is a job, why don't we bring the jobs to the jail instead of letting, getting people. Uh, now, we do have this st- saying at the jail, and I mean it. And um, I've learned this from Hamden County, the first one I talked to the sheriff out there, Ash. He was there for 35 years. But we talk about this. Reentry begins on day one. Yeah. You have to assess everyone who comes into facility, get them on the track to successfully reenter. You know? So what's more successful at the end of the day? Look, someone gets released from our facility. Obviously, they got to have a place to live. Number one, if you have a place to live, forget about it, right? Then you want to make sure that they have the mental health and the substance treatment programming available to get them on that another piece of that stool. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And we, when I got here, we were releasing people without even like Mass Health. Like 
are you kidding me? These folks are eligible for mass health. Why are we sending them out the door without having them get their card? Right. So we started this, uh, this office. We did none of this. We had no reentry team when I got there. Zero. You were released. Well, we started this team with one person. Now we've built it up into six or seven people, a reentry team. So we start the process on day one, and the idea is you meet with inmates when they're getting towards release. We work with them from day one, but then the specialty team comes and meets them 30 days out, 15 days out, 10 days out. Where are you going? What services do you need? Do you have your license? Do you have mass health? Make sure you get all those things because you got no chance getting out the door without that. Mm. And the biggest piece would be setting someone up with a job. So we started because we could authorize it. We brought in a job fair to the jail. And we brought employers into the jail to meet folks and people within the, like six months, I think, of getting out, they would come in. Well, it was a beautiful thing to see because people were connecting. Now, there's hope. You, you they, establish hope too. We're giving way. people something to exactly. you know, A lot of people they're thinking, like, oh my God, what am I going to do when I get out of here? Right. I'm going to be homeless. I'm going to be jobless because without a job, you don't have a home, right? Mm-hmm. So, and, and you, your family's only going to put up with you for so long as a grown man before they're like, dude, you got to go somewhere. But where are you going to go without a job? So, that's, I think that's a beautiful thing. It establishes that that hope and that light at the end of the tunnel so people do want to work on actual reform you know mm. reform well i'll just add one thing to this because for example if you go on you know on some of my social media because we put it out there it was just last week yep we partnered with a Corey friendly job fair and yep. it was myself in the da's office and mass hire and we put it on and i'll tell you we had over 20 employers there now I was a little fearful when COVID hit because we were really making progress and getting people employment, you know? And I'll say this to you. I've had plenty of people I vouch for who leave my facility. You know what? I know they need a helping hand. We give it to them. I have heard so many employers tell me that people have been incarcerated to get out. So they're some of our best employees. You know why? They know this might be their last shot at it. They're not going to yeah. blow it. Some of these temporary employees, they don't really care. They come and go, whatever. I've had a lot of folks tell me, employers tell me, you got to need more folks you could send us. Now, COVID hit, and I thought, oh, we're getting derailed just when we're making progress, momentum, getting people employment. Well, remarkably, the job world is better than it's ever been. And I'll tell you, I get calls from manufacturers, businesses every day. Can you get me people? I don't have enough people right now to to feed the jobs and demands out there. So it's an extraordinary time to be uh, even if you have a core uh, or, or a criminal justice background, to find employment, employers are willing. Now the economy is dictating some of this, but it's also people putting in the effort, you know? Um, you can see it in people who got out, they're doing great, they're proud. I will tell you a story I've told Eric when he first started. I said, I've been to every graduation ceremony we've had at the jail, whether it be getting your high set, which is a high school equivalency, mm. or substance treatment programming, or parenting programming, or whatever it is that you graduate from, I want to be there. I want to give you a your graduation certificate. We have a round of applause and we everybody gets a chance to say a few words about how these programs helped you. It's my most special part of being sheriff is when mm. they speak and they tell us how this program has helped them. But I used to say to folks, you know, I never want to see you again. Yeah. You know, kind of being funny. And I realized that's not what I mean at all. What I really mean and what's exactly happened is I say to them, I want to see you outside when you're doing well, when you're thriving. That's what I live for. Now, if I can get that, I bring that back to our House of Correction every day. And I share it with all our staff and our people to let them know I get the benefit of that. The work's done there. I can't tell you if it's every week, maybe more every day. I walk down the streets of Fitchburg or Worcester or Holden or wherever I am. Some will come up to me and I know exactly what's going to happen because you can tell I've done it enough. And they come up to me, Sheriff, you remember me? I was in this program and you gave me a certificate. And sometimes I remember them, sometimes I don't. But it's always the same positive story. That if they're not doing well, they don't want to see the sheriff. They're not proud of that. They they will cross yeah, the they're street. Hiding. They're they're hiding. Right. They I hope look... he's not coming for me. No, it goes back <laughs> right. to what you was talking about yeah. earlier. They don't want to. They don't they want to. They're seeking me out. But if they come talk to me, it's unbelievable how beautiful it is when they say to me, "Sheriff," they look me in the eye. I can see that they're sober. They're clean. They're they're functioning. They're flourishing. And they say to me, Sheriff, I want you to know I got a job. I'm providing for my family. I'm doing great. Your program. I've actually had people say to me that going to prison was the best thing that ever happened to them. And I know a lot of people don't want to believe that. Yeah, that's definitely not something a lot of people are going to believe. But my point being is that it can be a rehabilitative process if done right. 
And that's what we try to provide people, that it gave them the opportunity to find sobriety, to find the opportunity to take advantage of the programming we have, to get educated. Yeah. Hmm. To, we have a culinary program at the jail. We bought the old Salter School. You remember that Salter yeah, School? Yeah, yeah. We bought the whole, I wanted to get a culinary. I noticed that actually. I was like, what's the county? That, 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 that's weird. I, you know, because you're in a strip mall, basically. Yeah, so, we yeah. bought the whole thing. We wanted wow. to have a culinary program for years, but it was going to cost us $100,000. Salter went out of business. We called them. They sold us lock, stock, and barrel, their whole yeah. kitchen yeah. for $5,000. Classrooms and everything. We man. moved it right into jail. We offer four programming. We partner with Q Q Quinn Sigmund Community College. Nice. Four certificates for people. If you, you graduate from those programs, another thing we do, we allow the families to come and experience that meal. They get the, 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 the graduates of this program, prepare a meal. We have their families come in. It's an incredible moment. They get four certificates of completion. They are people begging for them to come work for them when they get out of, out of prison. So there's another program we have. We partner with uh, Anna Maria College with a musicology class where people can learn to express themselves. You know, it's mental health. It's, 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 it's a part of the rehabilitation process. They write their own music. They put on a concert for their families. This is in our facility. You know, we do it in our chapel. Mm. So... We try every way we can to reach people, to give them a chance to join a program to help rehabilitate them, you know? Yeah. So that's what this job is for me. You know, that's why so I So it's love not really it so about much. you or, or even your sheriffs going out and arresting people. The sheriff's department is more on the rehabilitation end. And we don't Especially do the... Worcester. Worcester is more Worcester Police Department. Oh, yeah. No, the, sheriff, the sheriffs of, Worcester, of Massachusetts. Now, we're not, you know, we're not Tennessee or South Carolina or whatever, Louisiana. You see the movies with the gold stars. Yeah, yeah. No, we're the... the gun we are... Hit. We are the people. <laughs> now, right. And some people have that perception. But I'll tell you, we do this beyond what you'd know. Because, I, boy, I could talk about this all day. We also run, besides the, the facility at West Boston, we have three reentry centers that I have in Fitchburg, in Worcester, downtown, and in Webster. Those are diversion centers where we say to the judges, we'll say to people, I don't want to send you to prison. Let's divert you to the sheriff's office. Here we will do drug testing, but we'll also do programming. We offer you education, substance treatment, job training, these type of skills. So you never end up going behind bars. You end up staying on that course and we help re-enter you. And frankly, a lot of people go that route and they never go the other way. Those are things we do. And we have graduations at those constantly. So there's a lot going on besides just putting people behind bars. That is are there. Are there any uh, like, you know, early like childhood preventative programs that you have in place? Well, the, you know, maybe with the schools or whatever, so that we, because one of the biggest things I've always heard is the school to prison pipeline. Yeah. Uh, have you intervened in that at all? Well, I, I, I think I mentioned with our off air, but I'm very proud of our face to face program. It was something that, you know, personally, I wanted to be a teacher when I was, when I was first getting into politics at 40, I'd practice law, I was a crossroads. So we created this program called face to face with a sheriff himself, me, 400,000 students go in, talk to middle and high school, uh, a lot of middle schools, mm. just about the, the choices you're going to make and whether it involves drugs and alcohol. Because frankly, if you don't go down that path, your chances of getting involved in the criminal justice system just drop 90%. Okay. So we talk about that. We have a program at, at our facility now. We just started it this year. You don't have like a scared straight program? You know, we did, work. Did you see that show? I yes. have. I saw, I saw a lot of them kids end up in jail anyway. <laughs> I know, I, I know four of the guys. It's not funny, but it, it is. They were in the original funny. program. Yeah. Yeah, I know four of them. I used to watch that show. It was so entertaining. We, that's terrible that it was entertaining because, yeah. I mean, that just goes to tell, talk, show how Americans view humanity. But yeah, yeah, that's. Well, occasionally you get a family member. We don't have much of that program anymore, but there was a time when I had grandparents call me. I, I don't know what to do. Yeah. Can you just, can you have my grandson come up and just talk to him and see if you can get through to him? So we kind of worked with the family to try to figure out the message, but this is a desperation moment. It's okay. not the ideal way to go. Right. But we do have, as I mentioned earlier, we have a parenting class now where the, where the inmates get a chance to have their children visit them on a contact visit. That's smart. Well, it's, you don't it's, want to follow them footsteps. Exactly. And yeah. it's parenting. So you have to engage in the class. And at the eight week mark is when you get, so it's a carrot and stick, you know, the carrot is you comply with this program. You learn the parenting skills. Even if you don't have a kid, you know, you can still learn the parenting skills. Yeah. We just want to try to help you break that chain of recidivism. Nobody wants their kids to follow their path right. if they're incarcerated. Nobody. Right. But you have to give them sometimes opportunities and skills to, to learn behavior that maybe sent them there and not passed it on to their children. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, I'll tell you how good this program is. Once the word got out, it, we now have a waiting list for that program. Oh, wow. That's excellent. Yeah. And we, and you can come up and see it, but we did, we created a new visitation we'll area. We'll yeah, you up. will. Yeah. What's and, up, Worcester? Are we there, Jerry? All right. He said yes. Yeah. Go so ahead. we'll, we'll show you, but we have a new, it's a new, it used to be, it's right next to the visiting area, but it used to be the old warehouse. Like, you know, we have like clothing and stuff, supply room. 
Now we turned it into a visitation room and we, we, we specifically talked to mental health, the right colors, the right environment, the right car artwork on the walls, the right things to make it a family friendly environment. Because mm. look, we ultimately, it's not for everybody. Not everybody gets and it's a us. learning experience for the whole family. It sure is. Good, good. That, exactly. I think that's important. It is. It is. I have one last question before Manny hits you with the really hard hitting question. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you're going to be able to ha- handle this one, but I got it. So we, we've talked a lot about the successes that you've had over the last 10 years. And you have this period of time coming up. You're running for a re-election and you have a goal, a vision in mind. What's the one thing that you haven't been able to do that you really want to put in place? Well, you know, my, the, my biggest problem has been budget. And I, and this could, I don't want to derail this conversation about budget, but I'll tell you, this is a fact and it's not fair. And it's been recognized by every sheriff in the legislature. The amount of funding for Worcester County, and I'm basing it on the history. It's not personal. When I inherited this job, Middlesex County, for example, which have fewer inmates than I have, has 20 more million dollar budget than we have. They have 27 full-time teaching staff. I have eight. They have, now we're catching up on the mental health counselors. They have the resources to build the programming that we don't have the resources for. And I have been literally begging our legislative delegation to provide ample opportunities for us, equality in our budgeting. Uh, We've actually had a study done by the Senate and the governor's office, A&F, and they identified Worcester County as the number one underfunded sheriff's department. So the frustration comes from that. I mean, we've been able to build some new facilities, as I mentioned, our mental health, where we're doing our warehouse into classrooms. You know, these are classrooms that are people who go in and they, they're the right atmosphere for people to learn, to be educated in. But we also have problems with hiring staffing because we don't have, and the salary structures, it's hard to retain staff, it's hard to get good staffing, and I have a very limited budget to do that. And I'm just, I'll tell you flat out, it's about $25 million less than my comparable sheriff's departments, which are Middlesex, Hamden, and it's not fair and it's not right. So that's and you my have more inmates. You have we, more. Have, we have more inmates than Middlesex, yeah. and we have a – but there, Is it based on the population of the county? Or? It's based on – Where is that? Politics of Poli- the past. Yeah. I don't know. From the past. I heard people hired friends and families of people, and they got benefits from that, and the political delegation in Boston is, more, is stronger than out here. So I was an inherited thing, and I don't want you to think for a minute, none of the local people, I get along with our delegation, great. And I understand they have other priorities, you know, I do. But if you ask me what I'm most frustrated by, it's that, because I will say, I will put our institution up against anybody for what we do for the dollars we have. It's incredible how, how much work we do, the great staff we have up there from our correction staff, our education staff, our, our health workers, our substance treatment team, our reentry people. I mean, I'm so proud of these folks, you know? Uh, I'll even tell you one if I got time, but we have a Webster Center. That's our reentry se- community center down at Webster. Now, I was able to open that myself. I'm just telling you that it's complicated how it's funded, but the Fitchburg and Worcester centers are done through the department of, uh, it's through the courts and the, and the OCC and mm-hmm. probation. But the Webster office, we got the funding to open it ourselves. Mm. And because of that, I, I don't have any mid-level managers. I don't have all that extra overhead. We hired the right people. There's a small group of people. What the community said to me when I got down there, I said, instead of me telling you what I'm going to do for you, what do you want me to do for you? Yeah. And you know what the first thing they told me? Transportation, Sheriff. We're the first department to ever do this. We offer transportation to people who come into that center, diverted from prison by the court, and we transport them to doctor's appointments, to job interviews, to because oh. that was one of the big excuses people had. I couldn't get there. Right. So now we not only started there with Webster and Dudley District Courts, we did such a good job, I'm proud to say, and because we could finance this, we have now two vans down there servicing the community. We're starting to work on a third. We've been joined by East Brookfield District Court, Uxbridge District Court, Milford. They all want to send people to our center to rehabilitate people, and we started with that type of transportation. But the reason I mention that, do you know in COVID, I'm going to be blunt about this, during COVID, some of these court systems have still not operating fully. Nobody needs services more than people who are in recovery. Nobody. And what did they do? They shut down and they became virtual worlds. Our center never closed. You always never, had people there. Always. And yes, we did it socially distant. And that was a tough thing to manage through. We all know COVID has, was a scary time for a lot of people. But our people were so committed that the, the, the conversation was not how long are we going to be shut for? It's how do we stay open safely? And I'm telling you, we did graduations in the back parking lot. We had families come in and sit outside. Like whatever it took to stay open and serve people because 
Look, great surprise. You know, after one or two years of COVID, uh, suicides rates and, and overdose rates have escalated. Wow, that's a real surprise to us that work right. in the business. We all knew it was going to happen, but nobody yeah. seemed to care. Um, so I'm really proud to tell you that. So even within our budget, the Webster Center is ours entirely. And because of that, we've kept it open. Nobody tells us you have to operate under these standards. The standards are set by us. And the standard was we're staying open and we're going to serve this community. And we've done it every day. And I'm very proud of that. All right. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Sheriff. Yeah. Uh, you know that I'm done with the easy softball questions, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna Manny's gonna hammer hit you. you. With it. you ready? <laughs> I don't know if I am. I don't know if Eric's gonna allow this. He might have us cut it out, but I, I gotta ask. What's your favorite restaurant in Worcester? Well, can I? I'm, 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 I'm kind of being <laughs> a little. Be, yeah, okay, the <laughs> reason I'm telling you this because I have a lot of friends, and I go to. I, I I'm gonna tell you, Worcester. Growing up here, and living in five different states, and coming back. There's no city that has the, I love the ethnic diversity of our restaurants here in Worcester and at the prices. Yeah. You can go to cities like Boston and pay a fortune. You come to Worcester and you've got every ethnicity you in the world. You've got a whole nice big fat plate, make a gig at your big belly just well, like me well, for that's, 10 bucks. So the year with me. So, <laughs> so, so I'm just telling you, so you talk about, you know, all the different cultures here, you know, that have restaurants that are so extraordinary. I go to all of them. I can't wait to go to new ones yeah. because it's so the variety. So I don't want to, Undercut any of my good friends who, who have been nice, very good to me over the years. But I assure you, within the within two miles of this facility, there's plenty of places I love and plenty of places I want to go to again. That was a phenomenal political answer. Yeah, that I was. really well, appreciate that. It's all political, that. but I mean, I mean it sincerely. I do all right. Well, <laughs> I'm gonna come back to you after you're not running for sheriff, and we're gonna get this answer. Even if you just give it to me off air, I need the answer. You need to let me know where I got to go eat. Well, That's we're going to do is. the same off air too, because I, yeah. as I mentioned, I would give you an example. Yeah, we did talk everybody. about one, but the uh, Belmont vegetarian uh, restaurant up there on Belmont street. Now that's num bomb. number one on my list of restaurants. I have not been to really. And my mom is in uh, assisted living right it's now. It's in my neighborhood. I drive by that every day. You can come park in my parking lot. I'll go over there with you. Well, Manny, now the hours aren't always open. Am I right about we'll that? We could work. All right, because I mean, I've yeah. I've stopped by and it's give been me closed. a number. I'll call you up. Be like, yo, shoot, yo, Lou, they're open. I was gonna say, shoot, Sheriff Lou, <laughs> 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 they're open. Come through right now. We'll go get it. Well, I'll take we you up you. on that. Let's exchange info, and next right. time I'm there, we're gonna go. I love it, Sheriff Lou Evangelitis. You're rerunning for sheriff. Yes. I mean, I'm gonna keep my opinion to myself because that's what we do here on What's Up Worcester. But what I'm saying is, you're doing a great job. What, I, what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing, and what we're about to go see, because What's Up Worcester is going to come down and check mm -hmm. out the, the facility. I'm so sure. excited for that field trip we're going to have one day. I hope you're coming with us. Always. Yeah? All right, we're down. So um, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your insight, and I appreciate your passion for what you're doing, man. Um, I have a whole new perspective on the sheriff's office, because before, I was all I knew was put your hands behind your back. But we're not doing that today. This has been The Sit Down. I'm Manny, Sheriff Lou, and John. Thanks, Manny. You're very welcome, guys. Thank you so much for coming. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for tuning into What's Up Worcester, everybody. We'll see you next time. All right. You good? Yeah. You liked it? Oh, it was amazing.